Welcome back to Progressive Talk Podcast number 14 with Dave and Josh. Dave, welcome back. Josh, how's it going? Doing all right. It seems like this week has been dominated with the Mueller report, been dominated with Tulsa Gabbard in many different ways. Kamala Harris making some tweets as well, it seems. She's kind of throwing around, isn't she? I mean, throwing out some tweets. Yeah. Yeah, she, uh, Kamala Harris tweeted out this this tweet that just blew my mind at how, I don't know, myopic it is in light of the progressives in the field. I want your feedback on this here, though. Okay, she wrote, quote, yesterday, I announced that as president, I'll establish a student loan debt forgiveness program for Pell Grant recipients who start a business that operates for three years in disadvantaged communities. Okay, so, end quote. Uh, that sounds just very centricy and very specific. When you put that up against to Bernie Sanders' 100% debt relief for a college debt, and Elizabeth Warren's, I believe, is 95%. Uh, there's a 5% of uh, college students who whose debt is over 50000 that won't cover it. But she just said, I'll establish a student loan debt forgiveness program for Pell Grant recipients who start a business that operates for three years in disadvantaged communities. It's like, what? What is she? Mm. How centrist is this, Josh? Mm. It's very vague. There's nothing there in terms of uh, numbers, uh, which, as you're pointing out, is sort of your typical way of communicating as a centrist Democrat no real details and it is very catered as you're pointing out it's not universal typically when we think of progressive programs we think of universal programs it does look like a way of indirectly maybe trying to get at as she calls disadvantaged communities what does that mean exactly one can guess uh, probably something to do with race yeah i agree and what are your thoughts there yeah, it, it's just it's it's way too complex and it's it's way too incremental and specific. Um, like you said, progressive programs are generally universal, um, and I just don't know what who she who is she going to win over in the field when you have Bernie Sanders saying he's going to eliminate 100% of student debt, and Elizabeth Warren who's saying she's going to eliminate 95% of all student debt okay like who's gonna who's gonna say oh kamala harris has come up with this really intricate complicated plan that maybe some people might get if they live in a disadvantaged community i mean come on this is ridiculous just centrism like i I just think it's so silly that in light of what her um progressive colleagues have have laid out where does she think she's going to go with this? It's just, I, I just can't see the political strategy in laying something out so painfully specific and complex. I think the goal for her seems to be gain some traction among black entrepreneurship. That seems to okay. be where she's probably going with this, and that they invest into HBCUs, historically black colleges, and it reduces the opportunity gap. That's kind of where she's going with it. Been playing since the beginning. She seems to be wanting to establish herself as the black or African-American candidate, you know, of choice because she's Mm -hmm. used the race card with Joe Biden. Now she's using this. So she's trying to pin the donkey on this identification. For whatever reason, it seems to me she is calculating that the way to win this election, at least early on, is to siphon away the African-American vote away from Joe Biden. That seems to be what I'm getting from this. What are your thoughts? Yeah, if she is doing that, which it, it's likely she is, um, it, it's it's very strategically myopic. Uh, just because, like I said, who would who in their right mind would would, would opt for something like that when there are other candidates in the field? Um, progressive candidates in the field who are offering across the board uh, universal student loan debt forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Um, Why would anybody say, I want the the complex, I want the more complex offering 
the one that I may or may not qualify for, uh, the one with all the fine print. You know, I'm, you know, I'm just saying we want the simplest way forward here. Um, so by Kamala, Kamala Harris playing this identity politics game and trying to be the black candidate and stuff like that, it, she's she's being very very strategically myopic in doing so. Um, and yeah. she is playing the identity and she is going to play the identity politics card. And she started right off the bat when she announced, she announced on MLK day. I mean, come on. How yeah. And then she made the comments on, uh, the breakfast club about Tupac being her favorite mm. rap artist during college, which was not even lining up with historical fact. <laughs> I believe uh, she was not even, or was it, she was in college before he was a rapper, I think, or something along the, the those lines. Li the timeline wasn't matching. That's all I remember. Right, right. And I think what she's also trying to capitalize on is the business class, you see. But unfortunately, there was a really, really good uh, response to her Twitter post. Uh, what I thought was probably the best one I saw. And I'm just going to read this to you. It came mm -hmm. from, that is the power of the Tennessee Pete. And he says, why would someone risk starting a business if they've got student debt? What a terrible, absolute waste of time forcing me to have to read and comprehend this post. <laughs> it almost got as many uh, heart, you know, thumbs up hearts as the original post. It got 1,500 yeah, to her 6,900. So. I, think she's, I think she got ratioed on this one. Mm -hmm. Unfortunate for her, she's not going to get away as easily as she did the first go around there's always a saying you should never come out too strong you know especially in a series or string of debates then of course you played your trump card and then what everybody's seen your hand mm -hmm. and so maybe andrew yang's a lot smarter than we think he is <laughs> yeah you know he definitely hit, hit his cards didn't he yeah absolutely yeah. Speaking of Andrew Yang, I wanted to I wanted to read a tweet to you and get your thoughts about uh, what he what he was talking about here. Uh, he was talking about the minimum wage. Um, Andrew Yang said, "Quote: A higher minimum wage doesn't help people like my wife, who is at home with our kids, uh, with one of whom is autistic. Uh, what what does win, what does minimum wage do for her? We need to think much bigger about what work is and what value is in our society." A higher minimum wage also doesn't do anything for retirees unless they go back to work. So I was just wondering what you were think, uh, what you think about, you know, is, this goes back to the argument: what's what's more beneficial, a higher minimum wage or UBI? Um, and, and this kind of like won me over, to be honest. Like he made some really solid points. Like a minimum, a higher minimum wage won't uh, help like people who are in caretaker roles, whether it's a family member. Uh, like his wife with his autistic son. Uh, he made a really good point there. I just want to hear your thoughts about that. I think that uh, the key word here is higher minimum wage. And I think it's very important to emphasize that because Andrew Yang has made it clear in the past he's not against a minimum wage. Right. It's just that he doesn't think bumping it up across the board is the thing to do because many businesses would be hurt, especially he mentioned those in the Midwest that don't have as much capital as, say, the businesses on the coast. In that sense, I believe he's correct in that context uh, that in addition to the negatives that come with having everybody get a much more substantial minimum wage uh, and the effects that I have on small businesses, particularly in middle America, it's also, as you just pointed out and his tweet pointed out, it's leaving out such a huge swath of Americans that – work hard to build strong families and raise their children or take care of the, their mm -hmm. elders. So absolutely, I agree with that. I think that in that regard, it is superior in how enc much more encompassing it is than, say, a minimum wage. And yeah, yeah. what about, how about your thoughts? I think you pretty much said that it won you over. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to touch up on like how it is, I agree with you that it is a huge swath of, of the public, like, like caretakers, uh, and he also mentioned retirees, like it, like a higher minimum wage isn't going to affect retirees uh, and, you know, but a UBI would. So there's just more blanket protection for more people. But like you said, like Andrew Yang isn't against a higher minimum wage. He just doesn't think it goes far enough for some people. And like he pointed out here, it makes total sense that caretakers or people in caretaker roles or retirees, the higher minimum wage does not affect them. 
And this is a large group of the population. So I just thought it was good points all around. Absolutely. Uh, in particular, I love how he is suggesting that we start valuing sectors of the population that for pretty much human history have not been valued. Yes. And so this is really a good way for, for him to create a narrative that talks to women's rights, right, and needs of, the, of women, because women are usually the caretakers, not always, but generally have been Generally. throughout history. And so I think that's a good way for him to, to speak to that, show that he is, in fact, a women's right candidate. Absolutely. For real. So, yep. And um, so, and then speaking of um, some of the other candidates that uh, we, we spoke about, Kamala Harris earlier, and the, the debate coming up and how it seems to me maybe Andrew Yang is calculating, gently sort of showing his hand as time goes on, whereas Kamala Harris is just really just throwing it out there, you know, for all of the cards to be seen early on. Now, with Tulsi Gabbard, what are your thoughts about her strategy? What have you noticed thus far with her debate strategy or her campaign strategy? Well, I mean, I, I, mean, I really I'm looking forward to this next round of debates because I really haven't got a grasp on, on too much of it or, or like a, a solid assessment, if you will. Um, like I love her tweets. I, I love uh, uh, I love hearing her hear, hearing her speak. Um, but I still need I don't know. I feel like I need more from Tulsi, and I need her to open up her policy set a little more uh, because her her flagship proposal of ending wasteful regi regime change wars, you know, it dominates uh, her dialogues. So it's like I really want to hear more about her progressive voting record in Congress uh, that goes back to 20, uh, you know, 2012 um, and her other uh, policy set items. So I, I feel like my assessment on Tulsi Gabbard is, is to be continued. Um, it, it's a work in progress. I like um, a lot of what I see, but this, this recent, what, what are your thoughts on this recent BDS vote uh, where she voted yes on HR uh, 246 uh, which is anti-BDS. Um, it seems like progressives are having a horrible time coping with this. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. And I just want to know, what, what, what do you think about this? Well, first off, I think it's really important to clarify that Tulsa Gabbard is not in any way trying to in interfere with people's ability for free expression or free speech. The resolution is non-binding. It's not a law. Uh, it's also possibly a smokescreen to cover up another res uh, another actual piece of legislation that would have been much, much more severe against BDS. Maybe she and others work to bring this forth as a way to prevent the more harsh one to be set forth. And in the meantime, there was more monies through a bill that just passed Congress. While all of this controversy going on around H.R. 246, another bill passed, and I can't remember remember what the bill number is, but it allows the U.S. to build relationships for technology, communication, election to integrity, uh, more additional monies, uh, basically unlimited funds to Israel. But what I really want to bring forth out of this is Tulsi Gabbard is not in any way trying to interfere with people's ability to uh, have free speech or stand against BDS or for BDS. What she's really doing, she's stating that she does not believe the BDS movement is helping the cause of either the Israeli or the Palestinian people. That is causing more friction, it's causing more angst and anger and violence, really, ultimately. And that that's not the way to go to go about it. That, so that's why she doesn't support the BDS movement personally. And so that was more a statement of expression, not an actual law that was put into act had stated in her response to her voting yes that she posted on her Twitter uh, yesterday. Now, in terms of how I personally feel about it or my takeaway, it's so controversial. You're not going to be 100% right on this discussion because a lot of this has to do with we live in America and we don't get the full details of what it's like to live in Israel nor in the Palestinian occupied territories. And everybody's got their story and of how things are going on over there. Now, of course, progressives have always generally sided with the Palestinian because we look at it as a David versus Goliath type of uh, circumstance, relationship, obviously Israel being 
the Goliath and Palestine being the David. You know, we, of course, have seen those videos where innocent Palestinians have been shot down by sniper fire. Uh, their homes have been bulldozed. So those are the stories we've seen. There have also been some Palestinians have attacked Israeli homes and bombed places. So it's not unheard of. It does happen there. The bottom line of this is really, I think, it would be good if politicians would step forward and provide equal discussion and not just come out with a resolution that condemns BDS, condemns both sides for their behavior. And I don't have a problem if they believe BDS isn't the way to go, the movement isn't the way to go to get to a two-state solution. But what I do have a problem with is it's not balanced because there was nothing really offered for Palestinians. If they don't have BDS, what do they have? They don't have a voice because they're they're an ant compared to an elephant. So you're going to take that away from them. So what negotiation power do they have? You see what I'm saying? That's what yeah. I have a problem with. And so it seems lopsided in that regard. And so the monies are going to Israel. Now they have this additional bill that was passed. And nothing's really said about what to do with the Palestinian people and their persecution and what they're going through personally. And on top of that, let's put masking tape on the BDS because we don't agree with that approach to a two-state solution. What are your thoughts? Oh, man, so much to take in here. (laughs) Um, Let me think here for a minute. Yeah, it's just, when I think of Tulsi Gabbard, like, she's a peace warrior. Like, you even have that picture of her, it says peace warrior underneath it. Like, why wouldn't she be, you know, most people are thinking, like, why would she, why would she condemn this? Because... Her main rhetoric is about peace and, and, you know, building bridges and, uh, you know, inroads for peace. And isn't BDS sort of like, you know, a step in that direction? Like, I think part of the issue, at least according to the uh, the non-binding resolution, they had written up a, a number of points. One of the points is that the founder, what they said, the founder said BDS would require every Jewish person to get out of Palestine, period. That they believe that the Jewish people are colonizers and they don't really belong there and and that land belongs to the Palestinian people. Now, my point uh, against that is that is a, a straw man because they selected that one guy. That doesn't necessarily mean all of BDS is in support of that idea. There are different opinions within the BDS movement, some that believe just get out of the occupied territories. You don't have to leave Palestine altogether. Uh, some want a two-state solution. So it's a, there's a very number of opinions, but the idea, at least from this non-binding resolution and the Congress people that signed on to it, their fear is it has been impacting the Israeli economy and it has been ramping up tensions between the two sides. And as a result, there's been more sniper killing against the Palestinian and more attacks of the Palestinian against the Israeli. And so they feel like it's not making it better, it's worsening it. And this is why the U.S. is stepping in to give more funding to Israel because they're losing, their economy is being impacted by the BDS movement. And they feel like if the economy of Israel is going to be impacted, It's going to result in them being more obstinate against even coming to the table with Palestine. But the flip side of that argument is if you look at Palestine it's and the amount of territory that they have had through time, it's been shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. Now it's down to like 10 percent of Israel, whereas before it was like 50 percent. So there's so much here. Right. And that's, I guess, the reason why I think she she's saying, well, maybe the best approach is not through BDS. You know, maybe the best approach is instead to pressure both sides to come to the table for two state right, solution. As, as we've always done, we've always done that. We've Remember? always wanted that, but then question then if we take this further down this complicated track, then we see that is it realistic to expect if the Israeli own ninety percent of Palestine currently today? Are they going to give up forty percent, give it back to the Palestinian people through a two state solution? Is that realistic? Yeah, good question. Probably not. Probably not going to happen. And certainly we have to believe Tulsi is logical enough. You know, she's sensible and smart enough to to realize that, you know. But she's also very – she has a very fighting spirit, you know. So maybe she thinks that she can get it done if she were president. 
Right. But but at the same time, like you see progressives, even some of her like biggest attack dogs, you know, like, you know, lashing out at Tulsi for this this particular vote. Like, I don't even think a lot of progressives have absorbed it correctly as you have, uh, where it's strategically not good for her or she just think we, she just thinks we could do something better. Like they're saying this is an anti-Palestinian pro-Israel uh, vote and that's it. The other thing I want to add to that is a, a piece that I'd forgotten even in my videos. If she had voted against this resolution, then people would have argued, well, in the writing, it talked about a two-state solution. Are you against a two-state solution, Tulsi? You see, so uh, she couldn't really win either way, you know. So I think she thought it through and said, well, maybe, you know, this BDS approach is not the best way to go about it. And maybe what we need to do instead is to uh, pressure both sides to come to the table and come up with a two-state solution. Okay. But, yeah, but I, again, I there's a couple non-votes, though. Do, do you see right. the people who voted against it? Like AOC was on that list. Elon Omar was on that list. Uh, mm -hmm. Some pretty reputable people voted against that. There was only 17 yeah, wasn't it Rashida Tlaib that was the most vocal yes. against this resolution? Yeah, three out of the uh, four uh, squad members did. Ayanna Presley actually voted yes uh, for it. Yeah, I do think it's interesting that you do still have a handful of progressives that felt that wasn't the best approach. Because it did feel like, to me, even though Tulsi Gabbard might have been very authentic about why she did it she authentically doesn't be believe bds is the way to go uh it still sends the message that you're squashing the voice of the ant you know compared to the elephant you know right it just feels lopsided that that's what i'm i'm getting to it doesn't feel it doesn't feel and you know there's that scale of justice is the, the two scales are in equilibrium right and so when you think about that, this is lopsided. So it doesn't feel like a just call on her behalf, even though on the ground, I can appreciate what she's trying to say. I just think that she's it, it doesn't come across like the big picture message is, is, yeah. is uh, where it should be. You know? Yeah, yeah. I just I just see the optics look uh, a little strange when you see, uh, you know, Tulsi Gabbard on the opposite side of the aisle as Ilan Omar. Uh, and as AOC, uh, you know, because mm -hmm. we think of Tulsi Gabbard as a progressive, but then then you see, you know, two really big time staunch progressives in the progressive community uh, on the other side of Tulsi's vote. You know, the optics just don't look good there if you're not willing to understand the nuance, maybe. The other thing, too, is Tulsi has always had some degree of appeal to the right. You know, that right. isn't unfamiliar to her. And she is she likes to to prize herself as objective and to be able to balance both sides mm -hmm. and in some way that has been beneficial to her and in some ways it's what is part of her appeal so like anything else that appeal is going you're going to find a chink in any appeal somewhere down the way sure. you know but in the whole i would just say that i don't feel the bill was really necessary is what i'm saying I don't feel okay. there was any real true purpose behind it. I feel like it really it, – it was almost going out of your way to make a point that we're against BDS, and it just wasn't necessary. Just leave it alone. Let them do what they have to do and work on a two-state solution outside of that. You know, right, If yeah. you want to ignore yeah. it, ignore it. I encourage them toward a two-state solution. Maybe this is their way of trying to apply pressure on BDS to come to the table. Who knows? Maybe it will work in the end. I don't know. We'll find out, but there's a lot of people saying it's a big, big stain on Tulsi Gabbard's name and her voting record. But mm -hmm. like you said, we'll see. We'll see how this uh, pans out here. But sticking with sticking with Tulsi Gabbard uh, on for a topic here, she just uh, filed a lawsuit, a fifty million dollar lawsuit against Google uh, for excluding her in the six hours. After uh, the first, the June debates, remember Tulsi was the most Googled candidate mm -hmm. uh, of the June debates, um, and she was excluded from the Google search engine for approximately six hours, and she's suing for...
anti-establishment topics, and she mm -hmm. is very controversial in that way. The algorithm is just too dumb, and they start to kind of associate her by association as a bad faith actor. And so then every time someone put, creates a video about Tulsi, then you know they get doxxed or something. And so what ends up happening is I feel like maybe the computer got overloaded and her name was kind of – something happened in the algorithm. Something happened in the, the numbers. But I still don't think that gives Google a license to get out of jail card free because I feel like this mm -hmm. is a democracy. And, you know, it's good that you want to to maintain the edges away from extremism. Sure. But if you are now affecting people that aren't truly extreme, such as Tulsa Gabbard, then you're impacting democracy, you see. And that's why I think Google needs to be held accountable for not doing a better job of creating the algorithms to be much more flexible and more and a little more smart. So I think this is a, going to be a wake up call to them and to realize that. People are getting tired of it. They're getting fed up. It's coming from all over the place. You know, it's coming uh, uh, toward YouTube. It's coming toward Google. And mm -hmm. you know, now you've got presidential candidates coming out saying they're going to break up these big companies. They know that they need to do something or else. You know, see, this is what this is about. What are right. your thoughts? It's, yeah, totally. I, I think she totally has a, a solid case. I, I think she'll win it to some degree, uh, but. I think the conspiracy theorists are going to have a field day with this one, though. Um, and, and a part of me even leans towards conspiracy uh, because Tulsi is, has been routinely left out of polls that I've been keeping up with for the past six, eight months or so. Um, I swear she was maybe in 50 percent of the polls I looked at. Uh, you know, and you know, the, the disingenuous framing in, in, in media about her, whether it was on MSNBC with Morning Joe or just whatever, like whatever it is, like there, there's, it's, it's too believable, whether it's real or not, doesn't matter. It's too believable that there's a conspiracy against people like Tulsi Gabbard. Well, there's a few things I wanted to sort out because even when I create my videos on Tulsi Gabbard, created a video regarding this topic. And even as much as I tried to explain that I don't feel that it's nefarious, I don't feel it's conspired, people still heard me saying that and attacked mm -hmm. me for it. So it, I think it's important to clarify what is likely going on. I feel as though CEOs, they live in this bubble. Or they live in a world of in, you know, CNN, MSNBC, Fox News. It's what they know. And mm -hmm. so when they go to create these algorithms, they're living their life through that lens. And they're hearing from Fox News. They're hearing from MSNBC that Tulsi Gabbard is extreme, you see. And or, you know, if you talk about this topic or that topic, topics that Tulsi typically talks about, then those people are extreme. And so they think they're just doing, you know, uh, their duty to America because that's mm -hmm. their lens. That's how they see the world. They don't see anything wrong with it. They think, in fact, it's a good thing. That's just their bubble. That's what they live in. So again, I, I don't think it's nefarious. I just think it's the way they see the world. And so they create uh, systems to that cater to their worldview. And then the rest yeah, they, of us are left yeah. out on the outside, you see. Now, when it comes to the polling, I think what's going on here is they're using old data. Usually they're using community survey data that comes from 2014, 2008, or even 2016. And the, the country has progressed since that time. Furthermore, they're basing it up on the typical voter block, which is older. And that's the way they normally do their polling because they, are, they can't assume that this upcoming election is going to be in a different from what is they, – they it's better for them to go by past data, real hard facts and data, than it is mm. to speculate or assume what 2020 um, – election is going to be like. So they just go with that model. And the model has typically been that older populations come out in droves and the younger population stays at home. And so that's what they use. And the younger people, in say, let's under the age of 50, are more likely to vote for Bernie Sanders, more likely to vote for Tulsi Gabbard, more likely to vote for Andrew Yang, and the older more likely to vote for Biden, and that's what you're seeing here. And so that's why I'm expecting there, there will likely be some surprises, just like there was in Michigan in 2016, when it was so clear to them, based on polling, 
that Clinton was going to win Michigan and Bernie when when you know when it was all said and done and the dust settled. Bernie went, ended up taking the state, and it wasn't only that state. He took a few others that surprised mainstream media. Interesting. Because they were using old data, you see, but they don't really have a choice but to use old data because, you know, they have to go by history. They can't go by speculating what might be, you see. Right, yeah. So, so there's no chance for, like, nuance to happen. They have to go by what happened in the past. Exactly, because that's hard facts versus just speculating, you know. Okay. Um, there are all right. ways to do it, and you do have some polling companies that do, you know, survey people. Uh, are you going to vote or not? And they base their polling based upon likely vote voters. Those usually are the ones who are going to tell you more than registered voter outcomes, uh, because registered voters generally are older. They're more prepared. Youngers, they tend to procrastinate registering and things like that and so if you just ask them not if you're registered but instead if it's a poll that's asking them are you likely to vote in this upcoming election i've generally found that tend to those kind of polling will tend to show Tulsi or bernie or yang to be more favorable i see i see now that's not to discount Dave, however, going down the rabbit hole because we know the military industrial complex is in its hold on the corporate state, and who knows? And we may never know, right? We still don't even know about JFK. <laughs> no, right. We're still figuring that one out. Right. <laughs> well, so, well, how do you yeah. think Tulsi's gonna? How do you think Tulsi's gonna do on the the debate stage? Uh, what does she have to do to really stand out? Um, you know, she's gonna be. I'm looking at the lineup here. In Tulsi Gabbard, uh, she'll have Andrew Yang on one side. Oh, and then Kamala Harris. So it'll be Kamala Harris, Andrew Yang, Tulsi Gabbard next to each other, and Joe Biden next to Kamala. Wow, okay, what a lineup. Uh, you know, so Tulsi went after uh, Kamala Harris this past week, right? Uh, what did she say? She she went, she went said uh, something that Kamala Harris isn't fit to be president. I don't know. She just went on a, you know, uh, on a, she just went after her. Right. It, it actually she went after her over the past two weeks, not once, but twice, okay. uh, actually, in some ways, three times, because the first time she went after her, suggesting that her uh, debate with Biden was a political ploy. Uh, she put that in a tweet. And then when she was asked about it again, she brought it up again a second time. And then when she was giving an interview with some supporting podcast, she basically said that Kamala Harris is not fit to be commander in chief. Right. Yeah, that was huge. Is she setting herself up here? Is she, is she setting the table <laughs> for the debate stage to go after yeah, Kamala she's Harris? Taking a, she's taking a, a card out of Bernie Sanders playbook because Bernie Sanders has been out busting his butt to show what he's going to be like as president, you know, going to Walmart, uh, Amazon, wherever he goes, things happen. Mm -hmm. And she went to Puerto Rico. So if you're asking me what she's going to do on Wednesday night, she's already done it. She's basically telling you, this is what I'm going to be like as president, and you can bet your bottom dollar I'm going after Kamala. Yeah, that's interesting. Like, I find it kind of interesting that she's chosen uh, to go after uh, Kamala and not Biden. In fact, she's actually warmed up to Biden in a few tweets going to bat for him. I find that strange. I find that strategy not not the best strategy as you want to go after, you know, the top tier candidates. Uh, Kamala, Kamala Harris is definitely making herself a top tier candidate, but you definitely want to go after, you know, uh, if you're Tulsi Gabbard, you want to go after Joe Biden, you want to go after Elizabeth Warren or, or just anybody on that stack on that tier. But she's in a very <laughs> like uh, in a very like puristic world where there is no sexism, uh, where people don't think in terms of sex, race or any of that. And I'm, mm -hmm. for the most part, I think most Americans don't. But I do think there's still a sizable number of Americans that think in terms of sex. And some of them, they won't vote if you're a woman. And then the others, they won't vote unless you're a woman. And that's where we are. And I think Tulsa Gabbard knows this. And so she understands. And she also doesn't like anything that she smells that's phony. And so that she sees that not only as an opportunity, but also as her rightful position to take down, you know. So 
if she went after Joe, if she went after Joe Biden, I feel as though it might hurt her a little because, and here's why I say that: you have to remember Tulsa Gabbard appeals to centrist uh, Democrats okay. more than probably nearly any other candidates, except for maybe like Klobuchar or Hinkenlooper, and she appeals to some uh, Republicans as well. And so does Joe Biden, and they have the same population. That's true, but they—it's too early for her to do that. I, I feel uh, she doesn't have enough weight. Now, someone like um, Bernie Sanders has enough weight to go up against Joe Biden or Elizabeth Warren, but I feel like Gabbard's too small for that. You know, she needs to go for smaller fish. You know, or oh, okay. me- medium, yeah. me- medium-sized fish first, okay. and maybe build up to it. Right. Exactly. Otherwise, she's playing her card right away, her big card. She's playing her medium-sized card right now. Yeah, and playing it rather <laughs> well. Like She's on the attack. I love it. Yeah, but you're right. It's not translating in the polling for some reason. Yeah, well, if Tulsi Gabbard was included in every poll, that would be great for starters. Um, I, I honestly too. still think she's being left out of a lot of polls, kind of like how Mike Gravel has been left out of a lot of polls. Uh, Andrew Yang was left out of a few polls. Uh, you know, it, it's it's happening. Um, I don't know if that's getting better, though, for Tulsi. Mm-hmm. And the same thing for Marianne Williamson. She's being left out of polling as well. Exactly. Uh, but looking yeah. at that first night, uh, you've got Williamson, Delaney, Hinkelooper, Ryan, Bullock, Klobuchar, O'Rourke, Buttigieg, and then Warren and Sanders. Your thoughts? Wow. Is that it? That's the first night? That's the first night. Oh, I'm just trying to see who's going to be out of here. I'm, I'm looking to see who's going to drop out after this. Uh, Delaney's got it. I think Delaney's going to stick around. He has the money. Uh, Steve Bullock, I don't know who this clown is. Uh, J- John Hickenlooper, he's got to go. Beto has got to go. <laughs> um, Tim Ryan has got to go. Klobuchar's got to go. Oh, my God. This is... This is a horrible stage. I'm trying to see who's going to be. All right, you have Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. Obviously, these are the two heavy hitters. Um, I don't know. Have they made a pact or not to go after each other? Um, I I kind of – I'm leaning towards Elizabeth Warren is going to pull something. I really think she's going to, you know, dig into some angling here. Uh, you know, she can't attack Sanders on his record, right, because he is a stellar – progressive record going back 40 years so you can't attack bernie on his record and if you do you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna pay for it uh so is there gonna be some centrist angling going on here with uh i'm not gonna say sexism but something along those lines because you like i said you can't attack sanders on his record if you're elizabeth warren you just can't where else can she go if she wants to position herself above bernie sanders I just don't know where else she could position herself. Um, Maybe the best thing maybe is to have like a, uh, an alignment pact where you're just, you know, neutral uh, among each other because you're both progressives. Technically, I guess, I don't know. Elizabeth Warren is that much of a progressive, Uh, but you know what I mean? Like, I don't know, but I'm not putting it past her to go after Sanders. I just don't know how she's going to do it. Have any thoughts about that? Okay. So when we talk about smoke filled rooms, there is, conspiracy theory and then there's reality there had been meetings with Buddha judge in back rooms to figure out how to undermine Sanders I don't feel like Warren now Warren if she is the queen because this is kind of way I look at her I look at her as the queen to be this is the way mm-hmm. she's thinking of herself mm-hmm. the queen doesn't go and do the dirty work the queen has yeah. someone else do it for her Thank and uh, so I think the attack dog here is someone who has come to the realization he is not going to win this election. Mm. The best he can hope for is to be VP, and that's Pete Buttigieg. Okay, okay. So you think Pete's going to show up as the attack dog for for Warren? Yes, either Pete Buttigieg or Beto O'Rourke, one Mm. of the two, both. Um, Warren is not – she's not – she doesn't do it that way. You know, she's going she's to be not confrontational. Much more, it's not that she's not confrontational. She can be confrontational. It's more that she's strategist and she doesn't she it's beneath her, you see, at this point in the game. Her uh, vision is long term. You know, she has a plan. Yes. And for her it's 
don't look dirty right now. You know, stay clean, stay above the fray, make yourself look as though you're you're better than everyone else. Have someone else do the dirty work for you. Do it uh, where nobody can notice. And then later, presuming you you get what you want, it might come down to Warren or Biden or Warren and Sanders. Then when she comes out, then the, then the knives, then the true Warren comes out with the knives. You see. Okay. That's kind of the All way right. I see it. That makes more sense. About, what do you think about Williamson and what she can do in this uh, to save herself? I really think this is probably her her last uh, way to save herself. Yeah, well, uh, she can do what she did on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert and just jump right into policy talk. Uh, like, like she didn't really get to where she needed to go in the June debates with policy talk. Uh, and what she, where she is on the issues, she has to do that this time, or like you said, uh, it's likely going to be over. It's just, you know, uh, she's still trying to get 130,000 individual unique donations, though. Uh, so she is trying for the fall debates. Uh, and, and if you haven't donated a dollar to Marianne, make sure you do that. We'll leave a link down below. Uh, but yeah, like I said, she's got to get into policy discussions. Uh, she has to talk about Medicare for all. She has to talk about a living wage. She has to talk about uh, student debt relief. She has to be talking about the issues and not so much about, uh, you know, the, 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 what is it, like the platitudes and the cliches. Um, you know, she really has to talk substance. That's where I'm at with her. Mm-hmm. Completely agree. I think you hit it on the nail. She has to deliver more in alignment with substance, less about her philosophy. Uh, mm-hmm. She talks more about her general philosophy and the Philly side of herself, then she's going to be more vulnerable to mockery. So she's going to have to line up with with uh, more policy, as you say, more. What are her plans? Take a little bit from Elizabeth Warren's playbook and say, hey, I have a plan, you know, or something like that. You know, I'm not saying she can say it that way. Maybe she could say it a different way. I've got two or three things that I, I'd like I'm, how we can address that. Mm-hmm. You know, something yeah. like that. Here they are. One, two, three. It, yeah. And like I said, yeah, like on like the, the Colbert, uh, not Colbert report, the Colbert uh, late night show, like she did that all within the span of seven minutes. Like she laid out her four point plan uh, for the Department of Peace. She talked about how she's for Medicare for all, you, you know, she can and she was just going rapid fire. So she knows what she has to do. And I think she gave us a little uh, peek into what she's going to do, and which is going to be more policy oriented. Right. And then. Of course, she'll sprinkle it in with her, uh, you know, everyone getting to know the uh, Marianne that understands system theory and understands how everything's interconnected and going back to our basic principles. You know, she sprinkled Mm -hmm. that in. That was that was just really good. A good job by her. I think it was probably her best performance of uh, any media that she's gotten up to now, the, the Colbert show. And so then the second night, Wednesday, July 31st, we have Inslee, Gillibrand, Gabbard, Bennett, de Blasio, Booker, Yang, Castro, Harris, and Biden. What are your thoughts on that? Hmm. Uh, A lot of no-namers, a lot of people who just need to be weeded out. Bennett Bennett has got to go. Bennett and and Andrew Yang actually have this silly um, uh, Twitter thing going where they're going to attack each other. And they're making fun of the whole situation. Like he's playing, like Yang is planning to attack Michael Bennett, and they're, they're having fun <laughs> with gifts uh, and like just silly tweets. I thought that was kind of cute. Yeah, I like the one where the two penguins on the ice and the snow, <laughs> and then as one of the penguins is passing by, the other one pushes it into the into the ice, and he goes yeah. into the water. That was funny. Yeah, this is downright adorable. Uh, yeah, but. Yeah, I see a lot of people who just need to go here, like Kirsten Gillibrand. Uh, I can see her really going for the throat, uh, like she did. She was, she was very vocal in the first debates. I can just see her doubling that. But she needs to go. Julian Castro, I don't see making too much of an impact, even though he had a solid June debates. I, I think he was one of the winners um, uh, for the June debates, but I just don't see him lasting too long. Cory Booker, uh, just another guy who needs to go. Uh, Biden and Harris, are we going to have a repeat of, you know, uh, going after each other there? I think Joe Biden knows he has to toughen up uh, and, you know, be more aggressive and be more, I don't know, uh, maybe not aggressive, but definitely more forceful than last time because he just got ran over. Um, 
Andrew Yang, Tulsi Gabbard. Definitely looking forward to that. Uh, Jay Inslee, this is another guy who needs to go. Bill de Blasio, this is another guy who needs to go. Um, I don't know. Who, what, do you, what are you looking at here? Do you see any fireworks between anyone here? Yeah, I definitely think that there's a very high chance there'll be a meeting of the minds again between Harris and Biden. This yeah. time, I think it'll be Biden that will likely retaliate. Mm -hmm. And he'll figure out some way he'll say, I take, you know, uh, I take umbrage with what you did or, you know, he'll he'll kind of twist it to make it look as though I thought better of you, Kamala. I thought we were friends. I can't believe mm -hmm. you did this. And what mm -hmm. are you try what are you trying to gain from that? You know, uh, to make it look shallow and empty and opportunistic. I think it will also be more uh, vocal about. Uh, I think he'll have practice and he'll likely talk more to the eight years under Obama in a more definitive way instead of a general way. He'll talk about all the achievements and how he wants to continue that and that we lost our way with Castro. I think he's going to go after Booker. Last time he went after O'Rourke, but O'Rourke's not on the same stage with him. So this time he'll go after Booker. I think he'll latch onto that and he'll figure out some way to climb. Booker's slightly ahead of him, so I think he'll try to take it take advantage of that. Uh, I think the moderators will do everything they can to make fun of Yang. They might bring up some silly question about circumcision or something along those lines. But Yang, I think, will be ready and he will talk more to his human-centered approach and why it's vital in this day and age with automation coming aboard. He'll talk less about the freedom dividend. They'll ask him more questions about him and he'll answer them. But his message, I, I think, would be to really talk about why it's vital we move from market-based to human-centered economy in this day and age where he talks about the loss of jobs with the truck drivers and the uh, retailer uh, job, you know, middle-aged women mm -hmm. is the number one job in America, how that's going away and how that's tied into why Trump got elected. It's changing and, and the value we're going to place on people that have never been valued in the marketplace, the mothers, the stay-at-home mom, and people that take care of the elders, and revaluing that, you know, I think that's just going to be really going to make him shine. But I also think he needs to throw in things like Medicare for All or uh, his democracy dollars over overturning Citizen United or ranked choice voting or uh, doing away with gerrymandering, you know, something – more than just the freedom dividend and human-centered economy, you know, bring out bring out something about healthcare, bring out something about I don't know immigration or something. That I think I think will serve him. But you can expect most of the attack to come toward him from the media and less from the other candidates. And with right, Gabbard, there's no value. Oh, I'm sorry. Right, there's no there's no value. You're absolutely right. And then Gabbard, also? yeah, I don't know. I mean, I feel like she's built up too much to not go after Harris. I just feel like there's too much mm -hmm. there for mm -hmm. her not to use, you know, that would be sort of like a, a empty bullet, you know, or something like an empty it's chamber. Like yeah. And then Gillibrand or Gillibrand, I feel like she could capitalize on uh, ending Citizens United and campaign finance reform, along with her being consistent about Medicare for all for the past two or three years. That could help her some. Uh, as far as Ansley, unfortunately, I don't feel like there's much he can grab onto. People are fatigued with the climate change discussion. Bennett, just sort of invisible. Booker, I don't think the media would try to prop him up, but I don't think there'll be much substance there. De Blasio, what do you think about? He just needs oh, to go. Oh, De Blasio. Right? I think he would just continue to try to sell that he's a progressive and what he did in New York to try to really push that he's effective. Yeah, I think that they'll stick around as long as they have money. Some of them are running out of money. Uh, like Ryan's running out of money. Bennett doesn't have that much money. Gillibrand's running out of money. Inslee's running out of money. Yang, unfortunately, is running low on money as well. But his campaign is generally small. And he can grow his his numbers pretty quickly if people just... He's got a, a loyal following. Let's put it to you that way. True. Very true. I think that's it. So it's going to be exciting. Yeah. We'll get, we can probably wrap it up there. Lastly, Dave, very, very quickly... Let's just do a prediction on who you think is going to walk away with the prize on night one. Night one? Yeah, just just oh, a kind man. of guess in the dark, sort of throwing a dart in the dark. Dart in the dark, eh? I don't know. I think Elizabeth Warren had a great uh, June debates. Um, I think she's, she's showing up. I think she's going to nail it again. Okay. How about you? 
I think you're probably right, uh, unfortunately. It won't be Delaney. <laughs> yeah, I think it'll be pretty even. I think actually it's going to probably be Buttigieg. I hate to say that. Uh, I think he's going yeah. to try to get as much as he can, much bite out of Sanders as he can. Yeah, he's sinking in the polls, so he's going to pull something. And then on the second night, Inslee, Yellowbrand, Gabbard, Bennett, de Blasio, Booker, Yang, Castro, Harris, Biden. A safe bet would be Harris. Um, I don't know. I just think she's going to do good. Um, I wish I was wrong, but I think she's just um, – I, th- I think she's good at being politically savvy um, and advantageous in these settings. Uh, so I'm looking, we're probably looking at another good Harris debate for her. Okay. Mm-hmm. What about um, you? I, I really feel like it's going to be Tulsi Gabbard. I do. Okay. Uh, I think that she's done the work and I think it's going to pay off. Yeah. Tulsi versus Kamala. I can't wait for that. Yeah. It would definitely be interesting. All right. So anything else you'd like to talk about for this podcast? I think we're good there, Josh. All right. Excellent. So we'll talk at you next week for Progressive Talk podcast number 15. Signing out. Bye-bye. All right. Stay progressive.